Hey everybody, welcome to OK Talks. I'm your host, Oliver Kendall. I'm a lifelong political nerd with an academic background in international relations focus and security policy and real world experience working in the US domestic political space and living in a number of other countries than my own. All of which combined, I think, positions me fairly well both to interpret for my international audience what's going on in the politics of my own country and to shed light for some of the folks back home on some events of note going on in the rest of the world. This seems to be another week that calls not for a deep dive into one topic, but rather for weighing in on a couple of things going on in the world. I've only really tried doing this once, but it seemed to work out okay. Besides, of course, me having no idea what the episode title should be, but, you know, I'll workshop that. So the first thing I want to draw attention to this week is the burial in Russia of Yevgeny Prigozhin. Now, for anyone for whom the name isn't immediately familiar... Yevgeny Prigozhin was a Russian oligarch, which is to say, basically, he was a one-time petty criminal who got close to Putin and thus ended up being absurdly wealthy and eventually the leader of the Wagner Group, which is a private military company that provides an opportunity for Russian criminals and former soldiers to go around the world wreaking havoc in a way that provides some deniability for the Kremlin. Wagner, of course, has become a household name over the last year and a half through its involvement in the brutal, unjustified, imperialist, and illegal Russian war on its democratic neighbor. But in reality, its tentacles have for a little while now reached far beyond the war in Ukraine to other what are often euphemistically called low-intensity conflicts in other parts of the world. Wagner has been heavily involved in Syria, for example, where it's fought on behalf of the brutal Assad regime, which, of course, Russia backed, since modern Russia's only guiding principle seems to be to be sure they're on the wrong side of every global disagreement. The group has also been involved in a number of conflicts in Africa, where they virtually always are there to either back long-standing global pariahs like Sudan's vicious former president Omar al-Bashir, or newer military juntas in places like Mali. They are ostensibly there to provide training and security, but it seems to be more basically just a cover to seize control of the gold and diamond mines. Wagner forces deployed to these parts of the world seem to be the same sort of vicious subhumans they and the regular Russian military sent to Ukraine, with widespread stories of staggering human rights abuses coming out of basically everywhere they've been involved. Numerous reports have come out of the Central African Republic, for example, of them having disemboweled pregnant women of them storming into and raping everyone inside of maternity wards and other sorts of things that are now tragically easy to believe of Russian military personnel after the way they've behaved in Ukraine. So I see myself here wanting to spin off and do an entire episode looking into Wagner, but that wasn't actually the reason I brought this up, so I'm going to save that for potentially later. Now, the real reason I mention all this is that, as most of my audience were probably already aware before I discussed it a second ago, Wagner has played a substantial role in the war in Ukraine, which, besides the inevitable and widespread accusations of human rights abuses, has resulted in the dramatic rise in fame of Yevgeny Prigozhin, who, in the context of this war, has stopped being a shadowy figure leading a shadowy mercenary group and instead stepped into the limelight as a warlord personally aligned with Vladimir Putin and publicly feuding with a number of other Russian officials like the Minister of Defense Sergei Shoigu. Now this arrangement worked fine for Putin for a while, but evidently stopped doing so a bit earlier this year when Prigozhin got a little too big for his britches by staging what basically amounted to a putsch against the Russian military and having a bunch of Wagner troops start marching toward Moscow. Now, Prigozhin says he never planned to overthrow Putin, and this was basically just an extension of his feud with Shoigu, the defense minister, but his public declarations that the war in Ukraine was basically just bullshit excuses for Russian officials to seize natural resources and enrich themselves, <laughs> ironic since that was exactly what he and his people have been doing in Africa, the Middle East, and likely Venezuela, that public declaration that the quote-unquote special military operation wasn't actually being waged to protect poor, weak, fragile, defenseless little Russia from those big, scary, marauding Ukrainians next door who might someday join NATO, that declaration may have been a bridge too far. The amazing thing, though, is that in a country where minor dissidents routinely fall backwards out of windows or <laughs> accidentally put polonium in their coffee instead of sugar... It really looked like Prigozhin, even after something resembling a failed coup, was just going to have to like, move to Belarus along with a bunch of his troops or something. But then the other day, the plane he and his closest lieutenants were flying on exploded in midair. But like, still, okay, why am I going into all this context and saying that Prigozhin's burial itself is one of the more important global stories this week? I mean... 
Russian internal conflict sends another Russian military asset to his well-deserved grave. Dog bites man, in the context of the last year and a half of open war, right? Well, in the background information part, I just can't help myself and probably just need the services of a better editor than me. But the other part, about the, the death and burial of Prigozhin itself, well, the way this happened, and then the very public, like, DNA verification, basically, that Prigozhin was, in fact, on the plane, all that, that matters, I think, because it looks like, like a real reassertion of Putin's virtually unchecked authority in Russia, in a way that is very different from even the Soviet era, or at least most of the Soviet era. The thing is, in a situation where somebody dies, and everyone assumes that they were assassinated by the state, you'd think that the state would want to leave at least a little ambiguity around it. Like, maybe you skip the whole DNA verification thing in order to avoid investigations into how the plane blew up, etc., since murder is still technically illegal in Russia. Although, come to think of it, private military companies are also illegal in Russia, so what are you going to do? Bottom line, looking at this from the outside, the brazenness of it all seems, to me, like an attempt by Putin to really just come out and say some form of, I am Judge Dredd, I am the law. Yes, you already knew that, but I just wanted to reinforce the notion and move beyond having to even bother with pretext that there is any need for some legitimacy here beyond the brute force. That's my guess. With or without the Judge Dredd reference, that's the message that I think he's trying to send with this. This, I think, has some implications in terms of how the rest of the world relates to Russia, both in terms of the war they started in Ukraine and more broadly. I mean, if we weren't already, we now more than ever need to be clear-eyed about the fact that the Russian government as such is really not in any way a legitimate entity. There are no checks and balances domestically on the country's leader, and they are stating perhaps more openly than ever before that they are not interested in following even their own laws, meaning that the rest of the world should assume that they will have even less respect for international law or any agreement they claim they will abide by. The only language these people speak, at least those in power now, is force. Hey, before I move into the next part of the episode and thus inevitably forget to say this, be sure to follow the podcast on whatever platform you listen if you haven't already. And if you know anybody else who you think might get something out of a show that can both interpret what's going on in the U.S. from the perspective of an American who's been outside for a while, and also shed some light on some of the big things happening in the rest of the world, <laughs> along, of course, with tolerating the occasional terrible attempted impression, be sure to share the show with them. All you gotta do is hit the button with the three dots, select copy link, and send it. This really is the best way for a podcast to get around, so my eternal gratitude to anybody who already has. Also, go do it again. And of course, thanks in advance to anybody else who will. So before, when I was talking about the Wagner Group, I briefly touched on the theme of human rights abuses in Africa. And the next thing I want to talk about in this episode relates to that as well, and also includes some of the same broader themes of outside forces being involved. So... A number of months ago, Uganda passed a law that broadly criminalized really doing, doing anything sexual that isn't straight. And I'm not talking a fine or community service or something, not that that would be in any way justified here either, of course. I'm talking life in prison for a whole bunch of pretty standard sex acts between consenting adults and the death penalty for quote-unquote aggravated homosexuality which lumps together a couple of things, I think, in an attempt to build on the slanderous narrative that being gay is inherently linked with being somehow predatory or coercive. Now, I should note for the record that Uganda, unfortunately, isn't the only country in the world, or even just in Africa, with laws calling for the straight-up execution of gay people. But most of the others are Muslim-majority countries, where apparently we've all just kind of decided to take the gross oppression of sexual minorities for granted. So the Uganda case seems somehow distinct and is probably the most high-profile example of this sort of oppression at the moment. Now, Uganda also differs from the standard fare Sharia-imposed heterosexism in that the anti-LGBT movement there has had rather a lot of active and direct support from American evangelical lunatics who have on occasion traveled there to push the narrative that there is a homosexual agenda to recruit the kids and turn them gay or something. And as the notion that being anything other than, like, super vanilla, pleated khakis and a sweater vest heterosexual is actually something that can and should be cured, that is to say, the notion that homosexuality or bisexuality is a choice, as that idea has lost favor in much of the West, and conversion therapy has been broadly outlawed there, 
At least some of the forces that once advocated those notions in the West, where it is now unfavorable, have gone elsewhere. Rather like how the American tobacco companies in the last couple of decades have basically had to relocate to friendlier markets like Indonesia and other parts of Southeast Asia once Americans decided cigarettes weren't cool anymore, the American peddlers of religious-based heterosexist hatred have also sort of been forced to move to friendlier markets, like Uganda. The presence of largely white American evangelicals supporting the local anti-gay agenda has had an interesting effect since anti-LGBT forces in African countries often seem to like to dress vicious homophobia up as anti-colonialist resistance. In effect, high-profile visits over many years from Bible thumpers like the now-deceased Jerry Falwell and the presence of organizations like the now-defunct Exodus International, which used messaging from people who had supposedly been cured of being not straight to push the idea that gay people aren't actually gay, they've just been recruited by the homosexual agenda and are choosing to sin temporarily. That is to say, the involvement of Western anti-LGBT forces in Uganda has helped convey legitimacy on both the existing anti-LGBT hatred and specifically on the idea that homosexuality, or at least more tolerance of it, is like a Western import, since the Westerners can be pointed to as experts of some kind. That is to say, look, these people from the decadent West are saying uh, that it's bad too, and even worse over there, and they must know they're from there, or some shit like that. In any case, I bring this up now because this week, two men in Uganda have been charged with the crime of quote-unquote aggravated homosexuality. This obviously is worth drawing attention to for a couple of reasons beyond just the rank injustice of it. For one thing, it demonstrates, unfortunately, that Uganda clearly means to actually use these laws. They're not just there for show, as could be argued to be the case in some of the other places with such laws on the books. Look, there's a very real chance they're going to kill these guys. And even if the government doesn't, their lives are probably effectively ruined anyway. And for one thing, they're most likely going to be forced to stay in jail, and I assume Ugandan jails aren't exactly hell spas, for some time before their show trial, I mean trial. And even if they do manage to avoid conviction and further punishment by the Ugandan government, they'd realistically have to flee the country anyway, because, I mean, obviously all of this homophobic agitation by the government in that country provides the perfect cover for heterosexist vigilantes to you know, exact retribution against these two people for, you know, being consenting adults of the same gender who maybe had sex. This also brings up a bunch of complicated foreign policy questions for the Biden administration, which, at the time the laws were adopted, started making noise about potentially restricting all kinds of foreign aid to Uganda, which is definitely worth considering in my view. On the other hand, the U.S. maintains relations with a number of the other countries that I hinted at before with similar such laws. This is all further complicated by the fact that the U.S. and the West are trying desperately to hold on to support in a number of African countries which have been, at best, ambiguous, if not at times straight up sympathetic to Russia in the context of their war with Ukraine. And many of those countries are at least sympathetic to the Ugandan government's potentially homicidal homophobia, if not actively considering enacting similar laws themselves. It's a tough one. But I don't see how the first American president to run for a first term is a proudly pro-gay candidate, the guy who once actively undercut the Obama administration's more hesitant approach to LGBT rights by coming out in support of gay marriage before his boss. I don't see how that guy cannot take at least some action in the face of this kind of regression, especially if Uganda does go ahead and execute these guys. Now, besides being just appalling on its face, this whole situation and the history that led to it, for me, also serves as an important reminder that the forces of cultural conservatism around the world are not anytime soon going to start allowing concerns about crossing borders or intruding into other cultures or cultural imperialism or some other such nonsense stand in the way of promoting their agenda and spreading their values. Those of us who oppose them should not either. Even if it runs counter to the ivory tower principle of cultural relativism, or might offend the hypothetical religious sensibilities of those we're trying to convince that, say, women or LGBT people or people from a different religion or no religion should not be violently suppressed or discriminated against. Those of us who claim to be for those things should be unabashedly for them everywhere and for everyone, not just for those lucky enough to have been born in a country or culture where we feel more comfortable criticizing. Okay. 
Well, now that I've fulminated about the things outside the U.S. that most caught my attention over the last week or two, I want to discuss two particular things out of American politics, both of which could probably be tied back to a drum I bang on rather a lot on this show, namely that Joe Biden is really good at the whole presidenting thing, and most of the arguments against him are stupid and shallow. So, this week saw, without too much fanfare, the first steps to implement a policy victory that healthcare reform advocates have been trying unsuccessfully till now to achieve for, I think, literally decades? So, I'm just going to resist the very strong urge to pivot here into a diatribe about how inefficient, unfair, and just plain crappy America's healthcare system is overall compared to the normal, non-communist hellscape center-left European country where I live now, <laughs> and instead just say that universal healthcare in the U.S. does actually exist for a few groups of people, most prominently in the form of Medicare, which provides free health insurance for every American over 65. The thing is, it doesn't cover everything. Prescription drugs, which are, you know, kind of an important part of healthcare, them olds sure do like their pills, have long been a complicated factor under Medicare for a couple of reasons. First of all, because Medicare doesn't entirely cover the cost of prescription drugs. So, although it may help pay for medication, many people who have Medicare in theory have free healthcare, but they're actually paying a shitload of money for the drugs that they are then prescribed during the course of that free healthcare. Secondly, because for some stupid reason, Medicare, as in, like, the organization, which is itself effectively a giant government-run health insurance provider, has, by law, for a while been forbidden to negotiate the prices of drugs with pharmaceutical companies, unlike private insurance companies, which are at perfect liberty to do so. The result, of course, being the comprehensive screwing over of both individual patients, since Medicare recipients have to pay a big chunk of their medication bills out of pocket or through having to buy some sort of supplemental insurance, and of the taxpayer more broadly, since Medicare is, of course, paid for by the government, which is funded through taxes. So then why am I bringing this up? Well, remember how in previous episodes I've gone on rather a lot about how Joe Biden is just straight up better at this job than any president since at least the late 60s? If you missed the episodes where I go a little bit deeper into why that is, they are episodes 42 and 38, and are still quite relevant at the time I'm releasing this episode, so go ahead and take a listen if you haven't yet gotten tired of my voice. I bring up this Medicare thing right now because one of Biden's oft-unrecognized but substantial legislative victories has been slipping in a change to the law that allows Medicare to finally have the right to negotiate with the drug companies. And this week, the administration announced which specific drugs are the first 10 that they're going to negotiate the prices of. According to the White House, Americans on Medicare have paid a cumulative $3.4 billion out of their own pockets for these 10 drugs. Just last year. This is, to quote President Biden speaking about another healthcare achievement a little over a decade ago, a big fucking deal. Because once this negotiation is completed, I really can't imagine we'll ever again see a year when Medicare recipients pay a cumulative $3.4 billion out of pocket on these drugs. That is, unless of course way more of the next generation of retirees are morbidly obese and thus end up with higher rates of diabetes, heart disease, and blood clots. Whoa, maybe I've spoken too soon. But you see my point. This is a huge win for good governance, for seniors, and of course for those of us who think that the healthcare system in America should be at least a little bit less of a giant feeding frenzy for the pharmaceutical and insurance industries. And you know what, I'm going to save the second U.S. politics thing I was planning to discuss for the next episode. It'll keep. So that's it for this episode of OK Talks. If you like the show and want to make sure not to miss the next episode, hit subscribe or follow on whatever platform you listen. If you want to help the show get off the ground, do remember to leave a review and most importantly, share the show around. To those who've already done so, thanks. To those who will, thanks in advance. Thanks to my friend Nate for having designed the podcast artwork and to everyone else for listening. 